Hey guys, welcome back to another q and It is June 7th, 2020. I actually just got done training. I feel like someone just punched me in the face. So if I, if I start drifting off, uh, bear with me. But uh, ironically enough, the first question is about PNS activation. So quite appropriate. All right, let's see. <clears throat> PNS activation techniques and or how to apply them to people who have to work out later in the evening, uh, closer to bed to help the body settle down and get the best sleep possible. Yeah, so this is something I've definitely talked about before and something I go over with some of my clients and, you know, unfortunately, there are sometimes schedule limitations and people have to work out in the evening, pretty close to bedtime. And then, you know, obviously that being a sympathetically driven activity and then trying to transition right into a very parasympathetically driven activity can be difficult. You feel like, you know, you you may feel like you're fatigued from the workout, but it's kind of that tired and wired feeling, you know, it, you don't really get the best sleep quality, even if you're tired enough to pass out type of thing. So being able to come back down is definitely gonna be important. Uh, I think it's important to just initiate that right when you're done. You know, if you wear like blue, blue light blockers, for example, you can put them in your car, you can just throw them on right when you're done. I get home, I would probably already have my food prepared if you have a post-workout meal. Take in something that is easily digestible, it, especially if that meal is one of your larger meals of the day, take in something that's you know, easily digestible, uh, gastric juices can potentially decline later in the day. And then, you know, going to bed with all that in your stomach, you don't want to really distract yourself, distract your body from being able to sleep, focus on that. So get home, uh, you know, whatever else you need to do, you need to take a shower, even doing like soft belly breathing in the shower, just to get it calmed down with some of the, you know, the warm water is a great way to relax. And you can bring, you can bring your heart rate I mean, like heart rate and blood pressure and everything normalize pretty quickly. Bringing your nervous system down can take a little bit longer. So, you know, getting home and doing that can definitely help. And then, you know, beyond that, it's just making sure you have the right environment. I wouldn't go home and flick a bunch of lights on and, you know, all that jazz. I would try to stay in a low light, you know, lowly lit environment. Um, do your PNS activation, like I just mentioned. Eat slowly. Then try to give yourself maybe try to give yourself a little bit more time between the meal and bedtime. Uh, you know, just stay just stay calm. It, that's really all that it boils down to. Whatever makes you personally feel calm is going to be helpful. Whether if you need to do something more extensive like guided meditation through like a YouTube video or something, you can do that. That's there's nothing wrong with that. It will definitely work. It just really is up to the individual, but. Um, initiate that routine right when you're done training and you could even do something like morphogens morphocom i like that for those types of you know the people in those situations excuse me take your four morphocoms full serving right after you train and then it'll start to initiate that process bring cortisol back down bring your your um your autonomic nervous system back it, into a pns state and you know it, it's going to help and you don't even have to use it every day it can just be something that you use on uh, days you train you know so all right <clears throat> best natural ways to battle insulin resistance and metabolic syndrome well so i've talked about insulin resistance obviously countless bajillion times um yeah metabolic syndrome is an accumulation of things right it's accumulation of skewed lipid profile insulin resistance you know normally comes with people being overweight you know so all these things are kind of in uh, in combination and that's when you end up with what they would call metabolic syndrome so with that sorry guys my jacket's falling down so with that um 
Let's see, I lost my question. I mean, the, probably, honestly, the number one way to battle it is to lose body fat. Uh, now, this also depends on what your metabolic health is like. You know, you might have a hard time losing body fat if you've been yo-yo dieting or you have other issues like thyroid downregulation or things like that going on in the background. You might have a harder time losing weight, but essentially um, losing body fat is going to improve all those markers and keeping it off. Uh, you know, other things can temporarily help or help. If you do them regularly, things like, you know, fasting windows and stuff, doing some fasting periodically, that can definitely help. It's partially the fasting. It's partially because a lot of the time when people fast, they eat less calories in a certain amount, certain time period. So, I mean, that, you know, obviously that's going to help. But losing body fat is going to be the number one thing. It's not how you do it is really just secondary, whether it's the low carb or you know, moderate carb or trace fat or whatever it is. I mean, losing that body fat is really going to be the primary thing. And that's going to begin to bring down, um, bring down those blood sugars, bring down insulin levels. That's going to help improve lipid profile, you know, all those things. So that's the short, eh? I mean, that's really the, the short and long of it is lose body fat. I would need to know more about this person to tell you where to start exactly, all right? So I would need to know like what kind of symptoms they have and what, what part of this metabolic syndrome, quote unquote, they struggle with uh, the most. And then there would be some more specific instructions in there, but in general, that's, you know, that's what you need to do. <clears throat> all right. What other supplements in addition to Morphicom would you recommend someone adding safely to help elevate a cortisol? This is assuming all other aspects of stress are being managed optimally. I probably wouldn't add anything, honestly. I mean, it's a pretty good profile. It's a, it's a really good profile. Uh, everything's adequately dosed, clinically dosed. You know, it contains ingredients and not only... Um, not only control cortisol, but also just general adaptions that will help, you know, calm you and, and balance your CNS and all these things. So, I mean, I don't necessarily think I would add anything to lower cortisol. Um, if you have, here's the thing too. I mean, the supplements, supplements like that, they, they do work and it definitely helps in, and in a lot of cases, you can feel an actual effect, right? It's not something that just works in the background. You can literally feel it working. However, it's still not going to, you know, um, it's still not going to outwork uh, any type of lifestyle issues. So you, and the rest is going to be balanced through lifestyle. Now you mentioned those things are intact. And then, so, I mean, if you still have elevated cortisol, I would ask why that is. There has to be a reason, you know, or do you even have real, you know, elevated cortisol? If you don't, then you don't necessarily want to just crush cortisol to nothing. That's also not good, right? So I probably have to ask some questions there and figure out like what, why you have elevated cortisol, and that's going to tell you what you need to fix. Fix the why, and you've corrected the problem, and then. Um, a supplement like Morphicom is definitely a worthwhile addition to help supplement your efforts, right? So, all right, next one. All right, Dave Kallick from Dave's Death Metal Corner again. <laughs> what more so is responsible for creating thrash? So for those of you who aren't metalheads, thrash metal genre, the genre. Gary Holt. Jeff Hanneman, I think that's how you say his name, or do you think Motorhead and Venom are actually the parents of said genre? Oh man, so you're making me like a historian here. Um, so I don't know when Venom started, but I do know that Motorhead started in the 70s. I'm pretty sure like mid seventies. So that's, and I would say that they fall under that genre. I'm not sure exactly how they classify them because there's so many sub genres of metal 
and and they you know they they constantly create new genres and things so i'm not really sure how they would classify it but i mean i would say that they probably fit in there so that's pretty far um that's pretty far back and then let's see jeff jeff and gary uh jeff came let's see jeff came before gary so i would say jeff is you know would be more of a uh original og thrasher than gary so i guess the question there would be did jeff come before motorhead I think the answer is going to be no, just based on how old he was. And I don't even know how old exactly, but I'm just guessing 50, so go back. So he's probably born in like the 60s, something like somewhere in there. And if that's the case, then he would have only been, you know, 10, 15 years old or something like that when Motorhead started. So probably not. So probably Motorhead and or Venom. Not really sure when they started. So probably those bands. And I hope I don't, <laughs> I hope I'm not butchering that, but um, I'm pretty sure I think my timelines are pretty close. All right. So next one, let's see. How much do you take into consideration foods with anti-nutrients? Okay. I recently read that certain foods actually have inhibitory digestive enzymes or enzyme properties. What would bodybuilders want to avoid foods that inhibit digestive enzymes? Okay. So yes, there are food, there are foods with things that are considered anti-nutrients. Now, how much do I actually consider that? Not hardly at all. And the reason is because unless the person has a nutrient deficiency, I'm probably not too worried about that. And plus with a variety, uh, with at least a decent variety of foods and, and not using those foods in huge amounts, I'm not too worried about it. Um, I think it's so it's important to understand too that a lot of these nutrients are in very small amounts in these foods so if you have some variety and you're not eating just ridiculous amounts of the foods it's probably not so much an issue and if they don't have any known issues or nutrient deficiencies then I I'm probably not even going to consider it um, I'm definitely familiar with the stuff and familiar with a lot of those foods but again it's not something I consider a whole lot unless there's unless it's warranted, unless there's a reason for me to consider it uh, with that person's specific deficiencies. So, <clears throat> all right. Name an underrated characteristic of a good client. Something aside from the obvious. Oh. Oh man. This is why, well, I don't really look at these questions ahead of the time, ahead of time very often. So I probably had to sit and think about this because there are a lot of things, <clears throat> there are a lot of things I pick up over the years that have, that I would say are really good characteristics of clients, but they're not so much typical stuff that you consider like, you know, like uh, adherence, right? Well, yeah, you, <laughs> you want adherence for a client. That's a pretty important, you know, pretty important uh, quality, punctuality, like sending updates on time and stuff, you know. Um, so I, here's one, I guess. So I do have, I do have a lot of, not a lot, but I have over the years at least, I've had a lot of people that are very good with adherence and also punctuality. They always send their updates on time. They always follow the plan. They always do all these things, but they are their own worst enemy in that they're overthinkers. So an overthinker is probably um, a bad characteristic in a client. So not being an overthinker, I guess, or just being enough, just being enough of a thinker. And I think that's also a skill that if you don't possess it right away, it's something that you may slowly learn as you go on. And people that are receptive to my feedback are all, will always learn it. Like I do have people that are that, or they were notoriously just overthinkers. And, you know, over time, I kind of was able to mold them and tell them, 
what was worth expending their mental energy on and then they could just become better updaters, right? And better thinkers, more efficient thinkers, more productive thinkers. And, you know, you think like a good update is this giant mound of uh, information and that isn't always the case. It's the right information and not some anxiety ridden like I measured my blood glucose every 45 minutes type of update. Like that's just not useful and it's just very stressful to everyone, you know? So, I mean, uh, being an efficient, productive thinker is probably one of the most important things because you can become a very good listener, learner, and executor uh, of your plan. Um, so I think that's that would probably be one, at least the one that pops in my head right away. <clears throat> All right, last one. What to look for when picking a fish oil supplement? Does... EPA and DHEA dose tell the whole story? That's a really good question. I like that question. I've, I've talked about this one before and I've talked about actually how to choose, you know, to look, what to look for in an omega-3 supplement, fish oil supplements specifically. Unfortunately, a lot of the products on the shelf are already oxidized or rancid because of maybe light exposure or the packaging isn't good or um, or where they're kept or whatever type of fish oil they used isn't very shelf stable, right? So it, it ends up being oxidized or rancid. So, I mean, essentially at that point, you're taking in a fat that's already oxidized and we're trying to avoid, you know, an abundance of fat oxidation. So that's kind of counterproductive to take a supplement that's supposed to help and it's really just negative, right? So another shameless plug, but I, I use the Morphogen Morph Omega and, excuse me, I keep burping. Um, it's a very shelf stable version. It is, I'm trying to think. Novatech, yeah, Novatech is the form. It's that's the the um, I believe it's the trademarked um, omega three fish oil that is used in the product. Very shelf stable. It comes in a powder form, so it comes in a capsule. Uh, it won't be rancid. It won't be oxidized when you get it. it. You know, so you're actually getting the benefit from it. And then beyond that, yes, the actual dose of EPA and DHEA matter. But I would say first and foremost is getting a product that's actually potent and not already kind of just junk when you take it. Uh, and and Morph Omega is not the only one on the market. There are some others that are pretty good. Um, but I use that one because I like Morphogen products. And it also has my dose of K, vitamin K2 in there and grapeseed extract and vitamin D and all these, you know, so it's, it kind of rounds out my cardiovascular health stack. And I know that I'm getting a quality fish oil. So that's why I use that. But again, first and foremost, you're going to want to look for something that's shelf stable and not, um, a lot of time it, it's your real cheap, like your real cheap fish oils aren't going to be the way to go. They're going to be junk. They're going to be rancid. They're going to be, um, oxidized probably almost entirely when you get them and it's complete waste and if anything it's counterproductive so this is definitely one of those things where you absolutely get what you pay for for sure all right that's it let me scroll over here yep that's it all right I need to go work on some PNS activation because my CNS is pissed right now. So <laughs> gonna go try to fix that. I appreciate you guys giving me questions once again and talk to you next week.